Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, Virtual um, Journal Club Friday morning. Uh, we've got a great lineup um, for you this morning with a um, very interesting topic um, and really a, a very intriguing research model um, that uh, we'll be discussing. The um, Before we get there, um, I think, Ariana, do you have the uh, World Congress? Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, put in a quick plug for the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer. Um, this is a um, program that's going to be in three parts. The first part took place March 13th. The second one is coming up very shortly on June 5th. Um, and then again in October, uh, expectation is likely there will be a fourth component of this in December, um, but we'll have more information on that encourage all of you to register and watch that. It's really an outstanding format and um, incredibly informative um, uh, from their faculty. Um, so I'd like to um, briefly introduce Dr. Insusa, um, who is an associate professor of endocrine surgery and who is also director of minimally invasive endocrine surgery at NYU Lango Health here in New York City. Um, Dr. Sa obtained his undergraduate degree in molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale, and then went on to get his medical degree at UCSF, where um, he also completed his surgical residency and then an endocrine surgery fellowship. Um, he moved from there just down the, uh, floor, the uh, California corridor to Palo Alto, where he completed a fellowship in biodesign innovation, and then co-founded a biodesign startup company um, before, um, his entrepreneurial um, uh, fervor gave way to um, academic medicine. Um, he recently arrived here in New York, um, uh, where he is uh, currently at NYU. Dr. Sa has authored um, 70 peer-reviewed publications and um, serves on many ed editorial boards. He's actively involved in uh, the development of uh, new technologies. Um, and so I want to welcome him and also today's discussant, who is Dr. John Russell, who is an associate professor and director of endoscopic and robotic thyroid parathyroid surgery at Johns Hopkins in the Department of Otolaryngology. Um, Dr. Um, Russell is actively involved in uh, developing new uh, techniques and methodologies in the management of thyroid surgery. He's also chair of the technology committee for the endocrine section of the American Ednex Society. Um, and in addition to his surgical and clinical practice, his current research focuses on outcomes and safety of novel approaches. So Dr. Russell will be discussing this presentation um, at the end, and I encourage everybody uh, to send in your questions, and we'll try to get to those before the end of the hour at nine o'clock. Um, so and Dr. So, if you could uh, start off, and once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, well, thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction, Dr. Erkin, and the invitation to uh, be a part of this uh, amazing format. Uh, and I also uh, am so happy to uh, share the stage with uh, my uh, very good friend, John uh, Russell. Um, and uh, I'll just get straight into it, if you uh, don't mind here. Um, so, uh, the um, you'll have to forgive me. Uh, the webcam doesn't work, so you'll have to trust that I look like the picture that was uh, just shown. <laughs> um, and let's see. These are my disclosures, uh, none of which are going to be uh, relevant, and I won't uh, mention any products that are made um, by any of these companies. Uh, so, as many of you are already aware, uh, transoral endoscopic uh, thyroidectomy and parathyroidectomy, uh, which I will now referred to in aggregate as uh, transoral endocrine surgery, or TES, has uh, become a, a truly viable option as a scarless approach to these operations in selected patients. Um, and the most widely adopted version of this technique involves the placement of three small endoscopic incisions in the oral vestibule for the placement of a camera, as well as instruments to track um, over the chin, uh, down into the neck, as you can see here, and dissection of the thyroid endoscopically. The middle incision uh, shown here is widened uh, to accommodate specimen extraction. The most commonly used acronym for the thyroidectomy variant uh, or is TOETVA, uh, T-O-E-T-V-A, or 
uh, transoral endoscopic thyroidectomy vestibular approach. And uh, that's been um, in deference to the person probably most responsible for the dissemination of the technique, Dr. Ankun Anawong from Thailand, um, who coined this term. But other acronyms have popped up over time, as uh, you can see here in the text. Uh, you, you may be surprised to hear that the current indications for transoral endocrine surgery for thyroid and parathyroid pathology are um, actually fairly broad. Um, so for the thyroid, most of the thresholds for indications are based on size cutoffs of uh, nodules as well as uh, of the lobe in general. For the parathyroid, it's a little bit trickier. Uh, most of us still advocate for the transoral approach only for uh, very well localized cases of primary hyperparathyroidism um, with clinical uh, predictors that would um, uh, highly predict single gland disease as opposed to multi gland. A group of us representing three busy practices uh, in large academic medical centers, including myself and uh, Dr. Russell, showed that over 50% of our current thyroid and parathyroid surgery patient uh, population um, technically met disease-based criteria and indications for the transoral approach. So um, based on this metric alone, TES is potentially not just a novelty procedure uh, that occupies an extremely narrow niche in our field. Um, as far as the patient level indications for TES, there is really only one primary reason, as you can imagine. Um, this is to avoid, eliminate, um, and obviate the presence of a visible neck scar as a consequence of surgery in a highly visible area of the person's normal portrait uh, profile. Obviously, this is all the more important in people who have real scarring disorders, such as keloids and hypertrophic scarring. Um, but an often overlooked idea is that theoretically all patients stand to benefit from the absence of a scar that is highly visible in daily life. To be fair though, um, you know, who shouldn't have the transoral approach? Uh, this list summarizes some of the important contraindications such as the history of significant prior head and neck surgery, trauma or irradiation, uh, the presence of multiple significant medical comorbidities, including um, uh, a morbid obesity, although that's becoming more arguable, uh, significant oral pathology, um, and also a patient who is um, unmotivated to undergo the unique aspects of transoral surgery and recovery issues and in comparison to the um, arguably simpler recovery process for the traditionally open approach. But again, back to the issue uh, at hand, is a neck scar really uh, such a big deal? Uh, this is a common question that skeptics will often pose. Um, and, you know, more often than not, with a little bit of dose of bias and maybe a little bit of judgment, um, that it leaves unsaid the, this opinion that, well, you know, this is just a cosmetic issue. Um, again, as if that is also something that doesn't really deserve consideration. Um, in response, I, I often like to share this video of a patient uh, who was treated by my friend uh, or our friend, Ray Grogan at Baylor when he was at the University of Chicago. And I think she captures this idea uh, pretty well. Just every single time looking into the mirror, I didn't need to be reminded of my own mortality. You know, it's, it's a constant reminder of the time that I had cancer. So aesthetically, it wasn't a big thing for me, but just to have that constant reminder, I didn't want it. And so, you know, I think she summarizes it well. It, it's intuitive that scars are on some level important to people, and it's not necessarily just a quote, cosmetic issue. It's this idea of the constant visible reminder uh, to the patient of a disease that they had once had or have, uh, as well as an unwanted marker to the rest of the world of this disease, which um, if you think about it in its own way, touches on ethical issues, such as an unavoidable violation in patient privacy. Um, and then to take the analogy to something um, a little bit further, like plastic surgery as a whole field, um, I would liken this more to the uh, reconstructive mission of the field as, as opposed to a purely aesthetic one, um, such as, let's say, the very accepted concept of immediate breast implant and reconstruction after mastectomy for breast cancer. And the data bears out uh, that the scars that we leave do matter to our patients, um, particularly our younger ones. This paper published in Thyroid um, in 2016 was a study using a number of quality of life survey tools on uh, almost 300 young uh, thyroid cancer survivors, which found that among other things, compared to older adults, scar-related complaints were significantly more frequent and severe. Uh, 
similarly, uh, this study of almost 100 uh, Korean uh, thyroid cancer patients who had undergone thyroidectomy uh, traditionally demonstrated not only the quality of life uh, decrements exist as a result of the unhappiness that they have with the scar and the healing, but also on objective evaluation of the healing neck scars, um, fully two thirds of the patients had healing patterns that were other than the quote, normal linear flat scar. So you know, clearly there's a reason for patients to be left feeling a little bit less than thrilled with the outcome, but it, it may not catch the attention uh, to uh, their surgeons um, in their total of maybe two uh, interactions that they have with them in total. And uh, it's not just the patients noticing the scars themselves. This is a study by um, our friend, Dr. Russell, and his colleagues at Hopkins that I thought was really neat. Um, they, they took uh, eye tracking software to see whether there were any differences in the way that random participants um, looking at portrait photos of patients with thyroidectomy scars uh, would be different versus controls without scars. And the results were pretty striking. As you can see on the left uh, with the control photos, the participant's eyes um, stayed right around the face where they should be. Um, whereas for those with thyroidectomy scars, a significant amount of attention was diverted away from the face to concentrate on the next scar. So now you can imagine that if you were the person who was being looked at in a similar manner, uh, we can start to see why this starts to become a more relevant and important practical issue than sometimes given its true um, credit. Um, so, um, it's reassuring to know that in the first five-ish years of this procedure of being performed relatively widely, the data has borne out in the uh, literature uh, to show a very acceptable, even excellent uh, safety profile. Uh, this was an earlier 2018 systematic review of the available literature at the time, which showed that the rates of endocrine-specific complications, such as uh, recurrent nerve injury, hypoparathyroidism, neck hematoma, were on par with the traditional technique, while the uh, technique-specific complications, including things such as uh, injury to the, the mental nerve at the lower lip, um, surgical site infection, local skin uh, complications, and the like were extremely low. Now, again, um, it would not be fair and balanced to describe this technique only with a totally rose-colored uh, set of glasses. Um, this doesn't necessarily give the full picture of the figurative price you may pay uh, with this technique. And so here are some generally um, uh, maybe agreed upon or discussed drawbacks of TES. One, it generally takes longer. Um, I, I usually tell my patients to expect it to be at least uh, one and a half times out of the open variety. Now, experienced surgeons are getting really, really great at um, cutting that uh, differential down, but uh, there, there probably still is uh, a bit of one. Two, it costs more to perform, uh, definitely in the beginning of the adoption curve, and, and probably even when it achieves uh, scale um, due to the need for extra laparoscopic instrumentation and or even uh, robotic instrumentation for those so inclined. Uh, three, regardless of how rare the technique-specific complications uh, seem to be, they are still there, and they, uh, on some level, they do need to be reckoned with. Um, Four, this is probably, uh, and maybe a, um, a bit of a nuanced point, not a technique that should be done by everyone. Despite the fact that I am a proponent and I'm a cheerleader for this technique, um, I think it's fair to say that anyone wanting to embark on learning uh, something new like this needs to you know, have an honest conversation with themselves about their own comfort and skill level with uh, oral anatomy as well as um, laparoscopic or endoscopic techniques. Uh, as well as the stage they are in their careers, uh, whether it is uh, conducive or not, to so learning something that's very much outside their uh, current wheelhouse, as well as the, the environment and setting in which they practice that, that um, would or not uh, support a new program in, in, in such a procedure. So then a natural question that arises uh, from this, um, when someone is confronted with uh, different options, each with their respective advantages and disadvantages, what trade-offs are they willing to accept with their eventual choice? Um, so in this, you know, simplified two-by-two two table, I like simple things. Um, there's a representation of the two surgical approaches on one axis um, here on the, on the top, and then uh, the non-inferiority, let's say, or inferiority of the uh, transoral approach in any, any given attribute uh, on the other axis. Obviously, where one would theoretically like to be is either in the orange or green zone, where you're either practicing the standard of care with open thyroidectomy or 
improving upon it with um, with the transoral variety. So, for example, you know, if we're to look at individual attributes such as cosmetic outcomes, then I think it clearly belongs in the green room, where uh, TES is clearly superior, um, uh, or endocrine-specific complications, which also probably goes into the green zone because it seems like the rate of complications is non-inferior to that of open thyroidectomy, uh, according to the literature thus far. So where the really interesting questions lie, though, to me, are in this gray zone, where TES may be inferior on, in, on some level um, in some metrics to the standard of care or open thyroidectomy and a few attributes. But then how do we go about starting to evaluate those trade-offs? There's been a little bit of data that went toward answering this question. Uh, this was a 2014 study um, in which uh, nearly 1,000 um, adults in the state of Wisconsin were randomly selected and called, um, and they were surveyed to assess their theoretical preferences regarding traditional open thyroidectomy versus um, the remote access wireless alternative at the time that was being studied, which was transaxillary thyroidectomy. Um, now, keep in mind, this was, these were not actually surgical patients, um, just everyday adults being asked these questions randomly. Um, and among other things, they had discovered some results that were a little bit controversial, uh, or at least have some controversial implications. As the figures here demonstrate, they, sh they found that um, concern over a neck scar was significant enough that um, not only were half of respondents willing to pay an extra $1,000 in out-of-pocket costs for this, but uh, as to the graph on the right, half of them were also willing to accept the roughly you know, two times increased risk of overall complications in order to achieve that outcome. So, you know, if we're to shelve away the ethical implications of those findings that they relate to the you know, surgeon's duty toward patients versus um, the concept of the patient autonomy and preferences, et cetera, what's still interesting to me about results like these is that there was a need for more research to better understand what drove patient preferences uh, into decisions like these, um, especially considering that any discussion about TES does require a more comprehensive and nuanced discussion about its indications as well as its relative risks and uh, benefits. And uh, this touches on some of the limitations of studies like the Wisconsin study that I just showed, uh, which by design were not evaluating these things on the patient level, but rather on a broader sort of societal or, or population um, uh, survey level. Um, and, and so the respondents may not have been as intimately educated or familiar about all the things that they were actually being asked about. Um, so my colleagues and I, uh, when I was at UCSF, uh, felt that it was um, really important to get a little bit more robust patient level preference data that would ultimately help improve surgeon patient communication and, um, and for shared decision making. Which brings us to the article to discuss. When I was at uh, UCSF, you know, I had the great fortune of mentoring a surgeon from Thailand, Dr. Ruporn uh, Tupanich, who was doing a visiting research fellowship in my group. Uh, that's the uh, uh, woman to the left. Outstanding endocrine and breast surgeon, very productive and helpful with our research uh, projects. Um, but as it turns out, she had just gotten married to this fine gentleman on the right, uh, Santi Sanglesawai, who I also had the pleasure of getting to know extremely reserved and a quiet guy, um, but that belied a brilliant mind and, a, and turned out to be a collaborator. As it turns out, so he's an economist in Thailand uh, with expertise in behavioral economic techniques, such as the one that I'll be sharing with you today called discrete choice experiment. His main area of concern is um, actually not in healthcare, it's in agriculture and resource economics, but as it turns out, his expertise in the general techniques had great synergy with our group's interest in learning more about um, uh, patients' decision-making processes, um, and specifically the individual factors that play into the decisions. Um, it also didn't hurt, you know, that he now you know, had someone at home enforcing his continued interest uh, in, in our work. So, you know, we began this collaborative research project, and I think it yielded some interesting results. Um, but to give you some introduction into what discrete choice is, this is a modeling method originally used in applied or behavioral economics, for example, uh, to, to better understand the motivations behind um, consumer purchasing decisions. Um, over the past decade or so, it has increasingly been applied to questions related to healthcare. Um, and the general purpose of discrete choice versus other behavioral economics techniques is to specifically identify and also quantify the numerous individual factors that people may consider when making a decision among a set of choices that are offered to them. 
the uh, discrete choice is performed as a survey in which the participant is generally asked to choose between any given number of um, systematically randomized scenarios that, that vary the values of these individual decision driving factors. Uh, and so then you multiply this by an adequate sample size of participants for adequate power um, and then aggregate the data for fancy statistical analysis in order to estimate, number one, the probability of certain decision profiles being chosen, um, two, the relative importance that each individual factor had on the ultimate decision, and then three, the relative importance that each individual factor had to one another so that one could then do trade-off calculations and see how much of one attribute or factor would, would a person be willing to sacrifice to go with the decision that they ultimately made. Um, so, you know, again, to reiterate, introduce a few more terms here because it's important to understand. DCE or discrete choice is by nature a theoretical experiment. It's designed to analyze decisions made from hypothetical scenarios. Um, the underpinning of these scenarios requires the researchers to identify the potentially important characteristics they're trying to study um, a priori. Uh, so in, in discrete choice lingo, these factors are called attributes. Um, as well as uh, looking to see how much the attribute um, uh, may vary in degrees of difference, which in, in discrete choice lingo is called levels. So, you know, for example, say we want to do a discrete choice experiment to better understand uh, customer preferences when choosing a new car. Um, well, one individual attribute that likely plays a role is fuel efficiency or, or MPG mileage. And then the, um, so that would be the attribute. And then the so-called levels of this attribute can be broken down into multiple ways, but in this case, into three levels from, let's say, um, a fuel sipper MPG to average to gas sipper. So to go back to that, that first uh, bullet point here, the, the hypothetical scenarios that are presented to participants to choose from are randomly generated and evenly distributed by a computer so that it varies all of the attributes according to their levels and the patients have the um, opportunity to iteratively decide among choices that have some, you know, level of um, uh, comparability or equipoise to one to each other. This is a general flow diagram of the steps in conducting a DCE from initial idea generation to finish. Um, obviously, uh, we start with clearly identifying what the research objectives are, then systematically coming up with a list of attributes and their levels to study, again, a priori. Um, determine how the choices are presented to panelists as well as perform sample size and power calculations, craft the actual study protocol for the face-to-face -face encounter, um, then have a statistical plan for the, the, the data analysis. And so for our study, we will go into these steps one by one. So our research objectives, again, were to identify and quantify uh, the important individual factors affecting patient preferences for choosing among surgical approaches to thyroid lobectomy for benign disease. Um, I'll get into why we chose the specific clinical uh, context uh, in a moment. <clears throat> um, and then to go into the attributes and levels, this mini flow diagram to the left, um, it goes through our process of the iterative identification and validating our attributes and levels. We had made a first pass at um, identifying all the attributes we thought were important through literature review and discussion amongst uh, the, the main, you know, the three primary executors of the study, we were basically my two primary co-authors I introduced, um, uh, as well as myself. We then tested whether or not those attributes were actually important, and to what degree, in an initial qualitative survey of a panel of um, eight thyroid surgery patients, uh, as well as seven endocrine surgeons. During this process, um, we also solicited any additional attributes that we had not originally identified. We then ranked the importance of the attributes we found and validated that ranking with another qualitative survey with a focus group of uh, an additional um, and different set of eight thyroid surgery patients. Um, and so we originally had a list of approximately eight attributes. Um, and after the ranking step, we had noticed that five really were uh, overrepresented while um, there was a steep drop, drop off uh, in the prioritization of the, of the other three. And so they dropped away. We narrowed the list down to just the uh, top five. Um, and then Lastly, uh, we selected the levels for each attribute based on uh, literature review to identify our extremes and bounds, and then stratified them into three levels um, based on how well they would be uh, distinctive and discriminate from one another with um, good statistical um, uh, power. And so these uh, uh, were the attributes and the levels that we uh, had found. Um, 
The location of the incision was indeed uh, validated to be an important attribute um, from our focus groups, as well as the risk of mental nerve injury uh, specific to the transoral approach, a risk of um, a recurrent nerve injury, which of course exists in both, the travel distance um, for surgical treatment, and then out-of-pocket costs to the patient. Next, we planned out the discrete choice uh, design, which included the format in which we would ask the questions to the participants as well as the necessary uh, power analysis. So if you take a study designed to evaluate all possible combinations of scenarios from five attributes with three possible levels each, the, 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 the total number of possible combinations using a full factorial uh, design would be 324, which is um, way too many scenarios to ask patients to consider in, in one sitting. So we felt that was obviously too unwieldy for a survey study. Um, so the way we got around that was we, we used what was called, um, it's a long word, uh, an orthogonal fractional factorial design by um, nesting or combining uh, two attributes together, specifically coupling the risk of mental nerve injury to only the transoral approach, right? Since it'd be unrealistic, unrealistic to expect this complication to occur um, uh, for the open thyroidectomy approach. Um, so, narrowing things in this way uh, brought the total possible scenarios to 27, a uh, much more manageable uh, list of um, uh, scenarios. And then to make it completely digestible for patients, we then broke these 27 scenarios down uh, into nine separate choice set questions, and in each question asking the participant to choose among three distinct scenarios. So, nine times three then equals 27. This is what one of the choice sets look like. Um, you can see that it's asking the participant to choose among three scenarios, surgery A, B, or C, and then different combinations of levels going down the column uh, for each attribute assigned to each scenario. Patients uh, basically did this and then repeated this general format eight more times for the survey session. So that made for a pretty efficient and quick protocol for a face-to-face -face survey. Lastly, uh, with the data that we had now, uh, we, we uh, would have to perform the proper statistical analysis to aggregate into results that were understandable. And this is the part where I uh, definitely tell you that I am not an applied economist or statistician. So I don't profess to know the absolute ins and outs of all of the statistical analyses used, but just so that I can pretend I know what I'm talking about, um, we use the mixed logic model uh, technique to estimate the relative priority participants would place on each attribute on a given ultimate decision uh, on surgical approach. So the impact of each attribute on patient preferences uh, are measured in utilities. Um, those were analyzed by treating the decision on the surgical approach ultimately as a dependent variable, while the different levels for each attribute were treated as independent variables. And then the, um, the analysis is performed and the results are reported as beta coefficients with uh, confidence intervals. Um, we also use a, a commonly used method um, for estimating a sample size requirement for, for discrete choice based on um, the number of levels uh, to the survey, the number of choice sets, and the number of scenarios total, and arrived um, using a, a, a formula that's um, uh, quite simple uh, at a number of 56 patients. But um, DCE, discrete choice, is, is still an evolving field, and um, uh, the, the experts would seem to agree that, that sample size and power calculations for DCE is still in an early stage and is currently an imperfect art. So um, to be safe, we roughly doubled that sample size requirement uh, just uh, so that we can be sure that we're going to have something robust. Lastly, um, we set up uh, our study uh, settings and inclusion criteria. We set up this um, discrete choice to survey adult patients seeing the UCSF endocrine surgery practice in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area with the following disease-based uh, inclusion criteria. First, they needed to be deemed eligible for unilateral thyroid lobectomy as a treatment for a non-cancerous thyroid condition and have a surgical consultation with one of our surgeons. Secondly, the patient's disease states needed to technically meet currently accepted indications and size limitations for the transoral approach. So, for example, as you can see here, but that's the two nodules up to six centimeters, uh, but that's the three, four up to four, uh, goiters with maximal load dimensions of uh, 10 centimeters. We specifically are to, uh, narrowed our target population to those undergoing thyroid lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy, as well as exclude patients with known cancer diagnoses in order to avoid having the number of attributes uh, to study from becoming too unwieldy, such as you know, attributes um, uh, like concern for hypopara, uh, 
uh, as well as uh, oncologically related uh, concerns. So our eventual final enrollment for the study was 109 patients, which was uh, you know, even higher than we anticipated, and we're, we're pleased about that. For the actual logistics of uh, the DC survey, the patients underwent their initial new patient evaluation for their thyroid condition uh, with their surgeon in the clinic. The surgeon then did a first initial screen to see if they're eligible and interested. Then they brought in the study coordinator right afterwards on the same day to officially enroll the patient. And then the DC survey was conducted after a brief introduction into the study and a standardized and objective uh, description of the surgical approaches by the coordinator, regardless of how um, or whether they were discussed uh, by the surgeon. And so on to the results. Um, I'll um, try to uh, get through this uh, uh, within the next few minutes. The table summarized the characteristics of the 109 uh, patient study here. Uh, the main takeaways were that the age of patients ranged uh, from 18 to 87 with a reasonable breakdown by age group. Uh, naturally, the 41 to 60 year old crowd was uh, highly represented based on the um, prevalence of diseases. Um, and most patients were females, we would expect, although males were still represented reasonably well. A unique aspect of this cohort, um, perhaps reflecting the practice and geography of where we were, um, certain groups were more represented than, in, than may be typical in other parts of the country. There were proportionally more Asian patients. Um, a high proportion of patients were married, had private insurance, and had at least an undergraduate degree. Um, of note, um, you know, of the 109 patients, uh, nine patients eventually underwent a transoral approach for their operation, um, with the others undergoing the traditional. And so then these were the results of the DCE for all patients. Um, Apologies, again, there's some statistical ease uh, where I show beta coefficients and all of that. But the overall crux of this is to show that in all patients, the attributes deemed uh, by them to be the most important were expected. They are realistic and practical. Um, they wanted to make sure, first, that the risk of complications were low, um, that the, um, uh, and, and the other things that were important were the extent of out-of-pocket costs and the travel distance required for treatment. Uh, that's the red circle uh, section here. And then on willingness to pay analysis, which is basically a trade-off analysis as a function of the out-of-pocket costs that they are willing to pay, um, these were the dollar amounts on the right-hand column that patients were theoretically willing to pay to improve their complication risk, let's say, or to reduce their travel distance. Um, now, when it comes to the site of the incision and cosmesis, per se, uh, that's the blue uh, circle, we found that there was a significant interaction in the results between this variable and the patient's age. Um, and so we examined this further by um, uh, breaking the results up into two age groups. Um, sorry. And, and so when we did that, uh, basically splitting the age groups to those uh, up to 60 years old versus those over 60 years old, the results were pretty interesting. We found that in younger patients, there was a significant preference for the surgical approach that would leave them with no neck scar and were willing to pay on average over $2,000 in out-of-pocket costs to have this result. On the other hand, older patients significantly preferred having a neck scar, um, meaning probably having the traditional approach, and were, actually, were willing to pay thousands of dollars uh, to actually have that. And, um, sorry, uh, lastly, we performed additional trade-off analyses uh, not related strictly to out-of-pocket costs, in other words, trading off the other attributes uh, that we studied against one another and broke them down by age group. So for the younger age group, similarly to the Wisconsin study, we found that patients were willing to accept a small increased risk of a recurrent nerve or mental nerve injury over the baseline, uh, as well as uh, travel hundreds of miles to avoid a neck incision. On the other hand, older adults were willing to travel even greater distances to simply receive a traditional uh, neck operation or thyroidectomy and a baseline accepted complication rate of traditional uh, open thyroidectomy. So um, I'll skip this slide just for time, but you know I think um, the results sort of summarize what we had found, um, that a lot of the patient preferences were based on age and the trade-offs uh, were quite interesting. Um, there's limitations to any study, and, and obviously with a theoretical modeling method, you're gonna have some limitations. Um, first, um, uh, you know, DCE is not designed to include every single possible attribute that can contribute to a decision, just the most important ones that we identify in our iterative process of identification and val validation. Um, next, we specifically excluded patients with thyroid cancer and those undergoing total thyroidectomy, again, like what we uh, talked about. Um, but 
you know, there is a chance that some concerns about malignancy, let's say, may have um, uh, infiltrated the results um, and we didn't capture since we did include patients undergoing lobes for um, cyto indeterminate nodules. Next, there is an inherent trade off, um, that word again, uh, that we accepted when choosing um, uh, to time the face to face uh, DCE survey for right after the initial surgical consultation, which theoretically could have biased uh, survey responses depending on the individual surgeon's content and tone of the discussion. Um, but we felt that that trade-off was counterbalanced um, by a much stronger one uh, um, uh, to capture patients at their most educated and their memories are freshest about the details of surgery in the context of why they need it in the first place. More limitations include uh, that our attributes required using some set standardized values for the level of risk and cost estimates. Obviously can't address every single individual variation on the part of patient, disease, surgeon, geographic setting, uh, et cetera. Next, um, on a related note to the one that I mentioned a little bit ago, um, there may have been some bias uh, with painting transoral approaches in a more favorable light by some surgeons. I mean, by some, I mean really me, uh, who was the only transoral surgeon in the group. Um, so to address this, we ran our analysis after excluding my own patients that I had seen, uh, which also by definition excluded all the patients who wound up undergoing the transoral approach, um, and we found no substantive uh, change to the results, which we thought was um, uh, interesting. Lastly, our, our study population, obviously coming from the San Francisco Bay Area, may not be representative of other populations, and I would certainly be interested to see um, if any of these results are valid, uh, validatable in other settings. So. In conclusion, um, I hope um, I've you know, impressed upon you on some level the message that the effect of a scar in a highly visible part of the neck after thyroidectomy and parathyroidectomy is underappreciated, particularly in our younger patients. Uh, thankfully, I believe the transoral uh, approach has become a truly viable option as a safe and efficacious scarless alternative in selected patients. Um, but understanding that with all things, there are caveats and trade-offs that need to be better appreciated. And so we think that our discrete choice experiment did take a significant step toward better understanding those patient level factors as well as the individual um, uh, attributes that go into uh, this decision. Um, and we found that there did seem to be a, a great function uh, related to patient age. Um, based on our findings, uh, we could calculate uh, trade-offs um, and, and what we uh, have already uh, described in, in numerical form. But I think our results are just the beginning. I, I, I believe further thinking and study uh, amongst things is needed to examine um, perhaps the social and ethical ramifications of these types of trade-offs um, when it comes to uh, transoral. And so with that, uh, thank you so much. I, I may have gone a little bit over time, um, but uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any of the questions and I look forward to John's discussion. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sa. Always a pleasure to to follow you. I've been in real time going through and editing my slides and trying to chop out chunks of uh, what you've sh shared with us already. So <laughs> always uh, always nice to follow you. Maybe better to go before you, so you have to chop out chunks of your slides. <laughs> so so Dr. Sa and I have been working together on on this idea of the value of transoral scarless thyroid surgery for a long time, and. And really, I think as you're making these discrete choice experiments, really all that we're trying to do is just go through what is the informed consent process and how do we help our patients choose what's important and valuable to them. Um, and let's see if I can advance. They told me I was gonna have to click the first time. I'm a consultant for Baxter, which does not pertain to this conversation, I believe. Um, so I, I think really, as we look back at the history of all of our forefathers who went before us and the pioneers in thyroid surgery, every single one of them, you know, Dr. Coker, the Mayo brothers, Dr. Halstead, Dr. Kreil, all of, all of these pioneers were really moving the cheese on thyroid surgery. They were taking the, something that was a very morbid surgery and they were making it less morbid. And I think in, in our own way, what we're trying to do, what Dr. Suz is trying to evaluate is, does the question, does having a scar on your neck, is that a meaningful movement of the cheese? Does it move the bar and advance the field in an appreciable way that patients actually care about? And that's what this, that's what this study seems to be trying to answer. Um, that we actually had, had delved into the same thing, maybe not as elegantly as Dr. Suh, um, but we had asked, with some colleagues from Israel 
we had gone through to try and understand the value of non-patients that they might place on, on the decision about whether or not they had a scar. And what we found, we, we tried to replicate the Coro study from Wisconsin that Dr. Sa alluded to earlier. And what we found was that nearly 80% of patients, if all other things are equal, prefer a scarless surgery. And, and it was interesting because we partnered with the group Thyca, which of course is a group of thyroid cancer survivors. And we found that nearly 50% of the patients who had already had a scar and already had thyroid surgery would have preferred to have scarless surgery, which was actually an interesting finding, we thought. Uh, we did find that if it cost more to have scarless surgery, it dropped significantly. So kind of getting into what Dr. Su alluded to. Um, as you make these, as, as you go through, it's important that you have good data when you're talking to patients. And I think the, the primary reason to do that is when you're having these conversations, Dr. Su demonstrated that if you say, you know, there's a 5% risk of a permanent nerve injury, all of a sudden your, your likelihood of somebody deciding that they would like to do this, this procedure plummets. And so you need to understand what the numbers really are. You need to understand the, the macro numbers for all surgeons. You also need to understand your own personal numbers, which at the beginning of offering a new procedure can be difficult. You also need to understand the value propositions that different pl people place, different patients. As Dr. Su alluded to, maybe somebody who's older is less, cares less about having a scar than somebody who's younger. You need to have the right skill set. Uh, Dr. Su tried to control for this in his study by saying, as the only surgeon who offered the transoral surgery, what happened to his data when he pulled himself and his patients out of the 109 patients? I think that that definitely comes to bear as you're having a conversation with patients. If you don't offer a specific technique, then you likely are, are unfortunately his study didn't seem to show this, but it may skew the outcome that a patient chooses. Um, and, and I think it's also important that we be looking, that we have a long-term view of where the cheese is going to be going and where the field of thyroidology is going to be going in the future. So these are our numbers that we have published. I'm gonna just show these briefly with you. Uh, as we've gone through, and this is a combined study with Tulane and a, another good friend, Imad Kandil. And what we found was pooling all of our research um, up, up to that point, this was in 2018, um, that we, we had no permanent nerve palsies and no permanent hypoparathyroidism. This is a more recent study, including just the transoral thyroid surgeries, not with neck dissections, not with cyst joints, not with parathyroidectomies, just the simplest um, apples to apples comparison. And again, you see at, at, at our 200 time point, we had no permanent nerve injuries and no permanent um, uh, hypoparathyroidism. To date, and this is updated just within the last, you know, last little bit, uh, we've accomplished at Johns Hopkins approximately 400 transoral cases, not just thyroid cases, but again, cyst joints and parathyroids, et cetera. We still have no permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve injuries that have lasted longer than six months, which is what we define as permanent. No permanent hypoparathyroidism. Um, and, and we can, as Dr. Su alluded to, as you get more efficient with these procedures, they tend to take a little bit less time. And of, of course, a question that we're always asked is, what about cancer? And I, I would argue that th that bottom number, when you see that we today have zero recurrences and zero persistences, more likely has to do with the pathology that we are choosing to treat. Because of course, when you're talking about cancer, patient selection becomes even more important. Um, and, and so that, that I think give, demonstrates the ability that we have to innovate in the field of thyroid and thyroid cancer, just given the excellent prognosis that most of our patients have, uh, which I will come back to kind of at the end. Um, so that, that's kind of the first basis as you're having this conversation in your own discrete choice experiment, i.e. The, the informed consent process with every single patient. And then you have to say, does it add value? And, and Dr. Dr. Su alluded to this study that, that found that having a scar, no matter how well the scar heals, affects your quality of life as much as psoriasis vitiligo or severe atopic dermatitis. Another study from the United States found that about half of patients think that their scar is excellent about five years after surgery. And we all know that as surgeons, we strive for more than half of our patients thinking that we are excellent. And, and so 
the fact that almost 10% of patients want to have a scar revision five years after they've had thyroid surgery implies that for some patients, this is actually something that's important that we have a, a duty to try and minimize the morbidity of, and, and that maybe this is actually valuable cheese for some patients. Um, I, this study, I think, hammers at home even more, uh, a study by Dr. Sturgeon, that found that the number one adverse event that patients complained about was concern about their scar appearance after thyroid surgery, with almost 80% of patients feeling like their scar didn't look, look appropriate for them. Uh, so we, we've tried to dig into this, and Dr. Sell alluded to some of these studies. Uh, we tried to figure out how much patients cared about a scar, and something that most of us understand a little bit is money. And so we asked patients, uh, we showed casual observers pictures of people with a scar and the pictures of people without a scar, and we asked them how much they would pay to avoid having a scar and the surgery that goes with it versus, versus having the surgery but without the scar. And what we found was that the average person would pay more than $10,000 to avoid having the scar. Um, we, we've also, and Dr. Sell alluded to this, but we've done additional eye tracking work that really continues to confirm the fact that when you have a cervical incision, it draws the eye of the observer away from the face and that central triangle and down to the neck. And, and that we hypothesize could impair communication to some degree. And we all know that, that when we're talking to somebody, we notice when their eyes come off of our face. And, and having a scar on your neck means that sometimes some of the people that you are talking with will cast their gaze away from your central triangle and focus on something else. And that is more or less important to different people. And it's our job to figure out who, who that is. So, so, okay, so now we've established that maybe to some people it's, it's valuable. Maybe we've established that at least in some hands it can be safely done with outcomes that are similar to open thyroid surgery. So can you as a surgeon afford to build the skill set? And, and of course, one of the first things that we talk about is afford, can you afford it monetarily? Um, fortunately, what we've seen is that the finances of this procedure are essentially in, in United States dollars, very similar. And so primarily the, the biggest concern is operative time. And as those operative times start to decrease quickly, you can see over time that, that we continue to get faster and faster as, as we do these surgeries. Uh, there are things that you can do to predict your operative times even more efficiently. Uh, the number one thing that we have found is how big the thyroid lobe is. Um, if you've got a big nodule, it's going to take longer. And that's why most of the time my cancer cases and my indeterminate nodule cases, even though you really have to get an excellent clean out of that nerve along that tracheoesophageal groove, those cases are significantly faster uh, just because in general, those thyroid lobes are smaller. Um, uh, this, this is another, I think, important thing to realize is that this, the literature on transoral thyroid surgery relative to other remote access techniques has increased exponentially relative to those other techniques. Within the first five years, significantly more cases and publications on this, on this procedure have been performed. So uh, kind of to wrap up here, I want to talk about our own discrete choice experiment. Mike Lopez is our nurse practitioner at Johns Hopkins. Dear friend, a phenomenal nurse practitioner, a great guy. And as we started doing offering transoral thyroid surgery five or six years ago, I noticed a pattern that when Mike Lopez would go in and see the patient before I did, only about five or 10% of patients wanted to do transoral thyroid surgery. <laughs> And if I went in to see the patient before Mike did, about 90% of the patients wanted to do transoral thyroid surgery. And, and it was a fascinating discrete choice experiment to the point that eventually I said, hey, Mike, why don't you go over risks and benefits of thyroid surgery in general and don't mention transoral surgery and I will talk to them about that. And I, I think it's really critical and I don't know necessarily how to quantify this in a scientific experiment. I think Dr. Suh has done a nice job of trying to do that. But I think it's critical that as we talk to these patients, we very much affect what they are going to tell us. We all know that we can guide the conversation between a lobectomy and a total thyroidectomy. And it's the same thing guiding the conversation between a, a, a scarless surgery and an open surgery. But we have to be cognizant as surgeons that it is not our job to manipulate what people want. It's our job to 
offer and understand what the numbers are and have the available skill set so that patients can get what at the end of the day they wanted. And, and I think most of us intuitively realize that if you can have exactly the same thing and not have a scar, most patients would prefer not to have a scar. And I think the question is, can you really accomplish that and not have any increased risk of complications? So, so I guess in, in closing here, we really have to have an eye to the future with everything that we're doing because not having a scar is great, but really the, the long-term value in adding technology is can it make our patients safer? And one of the things that I get most excited about is the opportunity to, if we are using cameras and scopes, all of a sudden, all of that data becomes collectible. We can start to, not only, not only is that data collectible that we can use it and we can help facilitate robotic surgery in the future and assisted surgery, we can do all of those things. But additionally, we can start to use different filters on, our, on cameras, including filters that help us to identify parathyroid glands. And this is, this is a grant that we've submitted and part of which has been funded already to, to help us identify parathyroid glands better without having to interrupt the flow. And a lot of us are working with, uh, with parathyroid autofluorescence, but we all know that sometimes the flow can be disrupted. And as we start to move everything forward with technology, we start to, to make all of these additional advancements easier. And that's kind of the long-term vision of where we're going. And I think the other, the other thing that we have to talk about as we're talking to patients, and one of the things that certainly has, has affected our, our people, our patients deciding whether or not they do want to do transoral thyroid surgery is the growth of radiofrequency ablation. Um, as a thyroidologist, <clears throat> your skill set has, has expanded, should be expanding greatly. And the last five to 10 years have just been a very exciting time to be a thyroid interventionalist with the number of options that we have. And these conversations all of a sudden are not quick conversations. It's not, you know, it used to be when I was in training, the conversation was, do you do surgery or not? Then the conversation advanced to, do you, should you do a lobe or a total? Then the conversation evolved to, should we do scarless, a lobe or a total or surgery or not? What should we do? And now you have to add radiofrequency ablation in there. And somewhere along the way, we've also got molecular markers. These conversations are expanding, and to be a 21st century thyroidologist, thyroid interventionalist, you know, really, that's that's the conversation. This is becoming a very personalized journey, um, and and the goal is to be the person moving the cheese, not chasing the cheese. Um, so, Dr. Sa, uh, great paper. Thanks for the opportunity to to discuss it. Thanks to the, the this think collaboration, and uh, very glad to be involved. Great, um, great uh, presentations um, by both uh, both of you, and um, really food for thought here. Um, I, I think that um, there are several different topics that I'd like to go over with you. One of them, um, which I think has to be brought up here, is this risk of uh, mental nerve morbidity, um, and. Having, having seen two patients, and I'm not, I don't want to be here the, the naysayer, but more the devil's advocate, having seen two patients who have come um, in to see if I can be of some help to them with um, anesthesia of the lower lip, um, I, I wonder in your surveys how much of a, um, this you're actually portraying. And so, and, and so having lived in the head and neck cancer world throughout my career, um, and also looking at the impact of um, various morbidities, mental nerve morbidity, mental nerve anesthesia is a critical thing. And so if, when you're presenting this um, to patients, do you actually tell them that um, before they fill out these studies, that anesthesia of the lower lip will can and will lead to drooling to me that's just an incredible um question that if you don't present it that way could have a great impact on um how a person perceives this um this surgical approach uh that's a great question thanks for that um so uh, uh I'll, I'll answer that in two ways uh one is you know um uh, how does the informed consent this discussion uh, happen uh, for my patients that are going to undergo transoral in the first place? And then the second is whether we included that information in the um, 
in the informational prior to the uh, survey uh, um, being done. Um, and so for first, um, I go into an immense amount of detail uh, with my patients um, uh, about the informed consent process. In fact, I think that was probably why um, a lot of my friends have beat, had beaten me to the punch on some level. Uh, I, I felt like I was probably being a little bit too much of a naysayer and um, uh, with my very first patients, because um, by the time that I finished describing it to them, they were running out the door. Um, but yes, uh, so the drooling uh, component is included, um, but, I, and then to answer the second part, it is also included in the informational along with the, you know, uh, obvious numbness uh, that can occur. Um, uh, prior to the uh, uh, the actual survey being performed, but I I think your point is extremely well taken because there's a difference in the way that the surgeon will be describing that versus a um, you know what is uh, recited by a study coordinator in uh, in a setting, and so um, you know I we we tried uh, to find a way to remove. Uh, to, to be able best to get all of these complications and implications across to the patients without introducing the bias of the surgeon. Um, and this was, you know, at the time, the best that we can think of, but it is a, probably a source of limitation uh, that, you know, perhaps patients would never understand uh, until they actually had it, um, what it means to have a, a real and significant mental nerve injury. I would probably include all the others, uh, to be totally frank, um, you know, the risk of losing the voice, voice hoarseness, dysphagia, you know, um, things like that are uh, ultimately um, theoretical concepts until it happens to patients, but we can do the best that we can, I guess, to um, introduce them about what that, what that risk can be. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and um, the, uh, the presentation, this is somewhat, but on a slightly different um, scale and uh, the the difference uh, that surgeons bring to the table or endocrinologists with regard to the choice for active surveillance versus primary surgery and there it's um i think it's pretty clear that the the person who is presenting has a great impact on the choice that's made um in many instances by the uh, by the patient who's who's dealing with this uh, critical question um, let me ask you, I, I, I got to believe that um, gender and culture are critical issues here in terms of how patients think about a scar on their neck. Can you comment a little bit on that, um, a, a breakdown between men versus women, and also um, a breakdown in terms of different cultures? Because to, I, I, I would imagine um, that uh, that's a major factor here. Absolutely. I think that's um, the, you know, uh, I think you were probably uh, um, spiritually in our lab meetings as we were uh, <laughs> designing this experiment because that was a, a, an idea that, that um, we really wanted to uh, look at. Um, if we enrolled more patients, I think we would have been able to have answered a little bit more. But ultimately, um, despite the fact that um, uh, when we broke it down by uh, both uh, sex and um, uh, ethnicity, racial categories, there did not seem to be a, a great difference in the um, uh, in our overall results. We didn't achieve the statistical power as we did um, uh, on age because when you break it down uh, to smaller numbers like that, we we couldn't necessarily compare the 28 or so males to the um, 70 some odd um, females uh, with enough power. Uh, same thing, uh, you know, on a on an even greater scale with uh, breaking all of them down to the different ethnicities. Each one represented only about, you know, uh, 15 or 20 patients uh, on average uh, with high variability. So, um, you know, I think that's that's the next step is uh, understanding those. And and I think your intuition is something I share very much. That culture plays an enormous role um, in in how people perceive scars. And and being of Asian descent myself, I I, I can sort of um, viscerally understand why a lot of these uh, uh, scarless approaches had um, originated uh, in, in, in Asia in the first place. Um, and so, you know, uh, I, I look forward, hopefully, to, to more research that, that answers those types of questions. All right. I, I, will, I will caution anecdotally that I am, I am always surprised by the people who, who choose, you know, <laughs> just, just yet, this last week I had a 60-year-old male 
who at the f conclusion of his goiters conversation said, oh, wait, you can do this without a scar, right? And, and so I, I think it's important that we, don't, that we don't make that judgment on the part of our patient who, who is going to want to avoid a scar. Yeah, so, I totally agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I hear those words here, but I think probably the most remarkable thing um, is the issue of cost. And that is clearly um, dependent on the wherewithal of the individual. Um, it is almost inconceivable to me that someone would accept the vast, that the vast majority of patients would accept a bill of $10,000 out of pocket um, in order to opt for this. And so if, um, if you could just comment on that. Yeah, I, I will tell you that I think it's inconceivable as well, and yet it happens every month. So uh -huh. um, we, we have not been able to figure out the billing, and so they pay top shelf Hopkins rates for uh, for a transoral thyroid surgery um, with no discounts or anything else cut into it if their insurance does not provide it or if they're from out of state or something else. So it is, uh, I, am, I am constantly surprised, but I think that that just, it, it reinforces the fact that this is a, a very patient specific decision to, to choose to do this. And there may be things that we don't understand that go into it. Yeah, well, and, and just to echo that, I'm sorry, it's a, it, it is nine o'clock, so I'm maybe running over. Um, I would echo what John has to say, uh, um, because it, to us, it does sound like an enormous amount uh, of burden financially. But again, uh, we are not um, necessarily the patient making that decision themselves. And I would liken it to um, the, um, my retrospective uh, alarm that I actually paid um, over $1,000 for my most recent iPhone, and yet I still did it. Uh, it's obviously a little bit facetious, but um, you know, I, I think that's the um, benefit of having these types of studies is that we can actually, without our own preconceptions, see what the patients are telling us. Uh, so, yeah. Terrific. Hey, listen, um, we are, we are um, at the nine o'clock hour and want to thank you both. Um, I think the um, extremely intriguing introduction of discrete choice um, methodology into medicine is uh, one of the great things that uh, your paper highlights. And so I congratulate you on that. Uh, to both of you, thank you very much. To all of our um, attendees, thank you so much for, for joining us and look forward to um, next week's presentation. Thank you all. Have a great day and a great weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.